Thanks, Josh. It is so great to be back together again. When our team talked about a theme for this year, I really suggested hope, dreams, and connection. It has been a long character-building pandemic. Everyday routines changed, and some of us may still be living in a state of hypervigilance. Many of our Buckeye family are still languishing, and even as our lives have begun to have some semblance of normalcy, we still may be struggling to dream again and have lost hope that our dreams can come to fruition. Let's consider today our January 1 and get back to dreaming and hoping again. Those of you who know me know I am passionate about evidence. I have a philosophy in God we trust, but everybody else better bring data to the table. There is a lot of science behind hope. So let's watch this short video clip. The Science of Hope For many of us, the new year is a time of reflection, a time to celebrate the past and look to the promise of the year ahead. We make resolutions to ourselves, we hope for health, happiness, love, peace. But what is hope? Psychologists define hope as a combination of agency thinking, the motivation to achieve goals, and pathway thinking. The ability to create paths to achieve those goals. Imagination and problem solving. The will and the way. The neural pathways underlying hope center around a region in the brain known as the nucleus accumbens. This area integrates information from three main structures. The hippocampus, associated with memory and learning, the amygdala, involved in emotional behavior, and the prefrontal cortex, which is central for decision-making and motivation. But hopeful thinking has even more wide-ranging implications. These pathways use dopamine, a signaling molecule associated with positive emotions, such as happiness and pleasure. Studies also link hope to improved physical and mental health, productivity, and academic achievement. And that's not all. Neural connections in the nucleus accumbens reach out to the medial orbitofrontal cortex, where they inhibit activity in competing regions associated with negative emotional states. Indeed, hope has been shown to reduce anxiety and depression. Hope makes us feel better. It makes us be better. It gives us determination, resilience in the face of adversity. It drives us to do what can't be done, to achieve the impossible. So this year, be hopeful. Imagine a better future, a better world. Together, we can make our dreams become reality. So, rainbows follow rain. Calm follows a storm. Morning follows night. And a new beginning follows an ending. We are in store for many rainbows following this pandemic. And I love 
this quote by Helen Keller. Optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. Nothing can be done without hope and confidence. So if I were your fairy godmother standing before you today, I'm going to ask you this key question, and I really want you to think about this and then to write it down. What will you do in the next two to five years if you know that you would not fail? I ask every faculty, staff, and student that comes into my college this key question. And you might be surprised, but a lot of people take a lot of time to answer this question. What I want to do today is fuel in you a new dream. Dreams, purpose, passion are so key in leading healthy, productive, enthusiastic lives. So again, please think about this question. And by the time I end this presentation. I really want you to write down your answer. Why is it essential for us to dream big again? Because nothing happens unless first a dream. We've got to see things, visualize them before we do them. And John Maxwell, who is one of my favorite authors, says, without a dream, we may struggle to see full potential in ourselves because we don't look beyond our current circumstances. Well, those of you who have children, you know, children find it so easy to dream and believe. But what happens as our children grow into adults? So many of them experience poor self-esteem, lack of confidence because well-meaning adults will say to them, that's not realistic. I don't think you could ever accomplish that. We've got to foster the ability to dream in each other, to hope again, and to support each other so our dreams come to fruition. Walt Disney, I don't know if you've ever read his story, but he was in his 50s when he got a big dream for Disney World as we know it today. He was bankrupt. He drew a picture of Mickey Mouse. He went from banker to investor, trying to convince people to invest in his dream. He finally found some folks that could see that vision. They invested, and he began to build Disney as we know it today. Walt died before ever seeing his dream 
come to full fruition. Supposedly, a reporter said to his brother at a funeral, too bad Walt never got a chance to see his dream come to fruition. His brother responded, oh, quite the contrary. Walt has seen his dream for many years. That's the power of a dream. Fred Smith was in college at Yale when he got a dream for FedEx, how to deliver things in emergency situations. His professor gave him a poor grade on that paper saying, this dream is far-fetched. That's never going to happen. We know what happened with FedEx. We, again, need to get back to dreaming, hoping, and supporting each other in our dreams. Well, research done by Dan Buettner, who wrote The Blue Zones of Happiness, he went all around the world looking for where people are the happiest. What he found was that people with big dreams, purpose, passion, and some pride in what they do are the happiest throughout the world. Knowing your sense of purpose, which is tied to our dreams, is worth up to seven years of extra life expectancy. Well, after we catch the vision for where we see ourselves in the next two to five years, we got to believe that we can accomplish those dreams because anything the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. And David Schwartz, who wrote The Magic of Thinking Big, always says, belief is the thermostat that regulates what we accomplish in life. When you believe you can do something, the how to do it develops. The question to ask ourselves, if we have some visions that are not coming to fruition, is do we have a fear of failure? And is that holding us back? Failure is always a possibility, but is that really the worst that could happen. I always tell my people, successful people often fail their way to success. So fail forward. But we've got to think and believe we are capable of achieving success in those dreams and those goals, because how we think seriously determines how we feel and how we behave. Well, we have 6,200 automatic thoughts every single day, and many of those are automatic negative thoughts that formed throughout our lives. So when you notice your mood has changed 
or you're going in a negative direction with a negative automatic thought, we've got to stop and say to ourselves, what was going through my mind right now? Is that thought really true? Is that type of thinking really helpful? And do I have the evidence to back it up? Because science, again, has shown us if we can change the way we think, we absolutely can change our lives and what happens. We've also got to take risks because we cannot discover new oceans unless we have the courage to lose sight of the shore. Well, anybody who's been successful at anything has probably gone through a lot of what I call character building experiences. Let's look at some very successful people. R. H. Macy failed in retelling seven times before his store in New York became a success. Abraham Lincoln failed twice in business and was defeated in six states and national elections before becoming president. The guy who wrote the first Dr. Seuss book, he went to 23 publishers with his manuscript. They all said, this is a crazy book. It's a crazy idea, but he kept going. The 24th publisher who thought, let's try it, sold 6 million copies of that first Dr. Seuss book. Fred Astaire's first screen test assessment said, this guy's losing hair. He can't sing. He can only dance a little. If you're struggling right now and you're not where you like to be, get the dream back in front of you again. Believe you can achieve that and persist through your character builders until you accomplish the dream. Well, We also have science behind writing down our dreams and our goals and putting them where we can see them every day. Studies have shown people who write down their goals, their dreams are much more successful at attaining them than people who do not. A lot of people ask me, Bern, what are the keys to successfully accomplishing what you want to do in life? And I always tell people the three Ds, the ability to dream big, discover which is all about risk-taking and the ability to persist through the character builders until you deliver. You see, so many people give up on their dreams because they work at something, they don't see it happening, and they give up right before It gets ready to come to fruition. We've got to support each other. Dream big, but then take one bite of the bundle of carrots at a time until we're successful 
at accomplishing our dreams. I grew up in a small little coal mining town right on the West Virginia border. My dad was a coal miner. My mom was a cook. We lived in a small little house. But my dad always encouraged me to dream big, believe, stay determined. And I really credit my dad with a lot of the success that I had in life. Because I went through such a hard time as a teenager, 15 years of age, when my mom sneezed, stroked out, and died right in front of me. But what I went through as a teen really gave me the gumption that I needed to dream big make a difference through what I did with my research, the developing evidence-based programs so that I could help so many children, teens, and college students who are struggling. I had a dream to be this country's first chief wellness officer at an academic institution in the country. I was blessed that I was able to pitch that dream to give our former president, Gordon Gee, evidence behind why he should establish this role. We've got to dream, discover, and deliver. I also was so discouraged by five well-funded NIH successful researchers to continue my research, developing interventions for parents of critically ill children and premature infants. They all told me when I didn't fund the second time on a big NIH grant, give up on your idea. Give up on this dream. It's not going to work. I cried for about 24 hours. And then I pulled my team together and said, let's focus on the dream again. All the parents and children we want to help, let's go one last time. That grant funded one month before my tenure materials were due. I wouldn't have funded if I listened to the negativity around me. We've got to surround ourselves once we have some great dreams with people that are going to support us. And when things are not going our way, we have to sit back. We have to regard the setback as a lesson. Maybe what can we learn from it? And I've got to say, Remember, success is going from one failure to the next with enthusiasm. Get excited when you get a closed door. Keep saying, I'm one step closer to accomplishing that dream. In this world, remember, everything is transitional. What looks like the end of the road will turn out to be a bend in the road. It took me 10 years of flying to New York City to pitch my dream for a National Institute for Evidence-Based Practice. What happens 
if I would have stopped pitching that dream in year nine, after 10 years, that finally funded. I'm going to end by telling you a story about an 86 year old man who walked into my office when I was research dean at the University of Rochester. He introduces himself. He said, I'm Lou, and I've read all about you on your website and how evidence is so important if something is going to stick. He said, Bern, I was home alone choking about six months ago. I really thought I was going to die. I had inhaled a hard tack candy. And he said, just as I'm ready to black out, I flung myself over a chair to try to develop a Heimlich maneuver. That hard tack candy jutted out of my throat. But after that experience, I thought, I need to create a device that if anybody is home alone choking, they would be able to put it under their sternum, push up, and create a Heimlich maneuver. He pulled into a briefcase, and as you will see on this slide, he had a very rudimentary device. It was a broom handle with paper roll towels taped and a styrofoam block. And I looked at it thinking, what the Sam Hill am I supposed to do with this? I said, Lou, I see your dream, but why have you come to see me? He said, Burn, I want you and your team to get the evidence behind this save a life device. I pulled an interprofessional team together. We established a clinical trial with this device. I was recruited away to Arizona. I thought my team finished this clinical trial. Five years later in Arizona, my assistant walks into my office and said, Burn, there's a guy on the phone for you. His name is Lou from Rochester, New York. I got on the phone. I was never so excited. I said, Lou, you're so excited. You're still alive. He said, yes, Burn, but I want to tell you, your team never finished getting the trial done. I need you to do this trial to get the evidence. I flew Lou to Arizona at the age of 91, he had a bigger twinkle in his eye and fire in his belly than a lot of 20 and 30 year olds because he had a dream. He wanted to see this device all throughout the country in homes, in an assisted living center. Well, I was telling this story a couple of years ago to my alums, two women in the back of the room were crying. I went up to them after I saw them crying and said, could you share with me why you're so emotional? Their response, burn. We had a great idea for a healthcare business 10 years ago. But everybody told us there's no way it would work. So we sit here 10 years later 
really upset that we didn't do it. I said, how old are you? One said 70, the other said 71. I said, look at Lou. You've got the rest of your life. Don't let people steal your dreams. I don't care how old you are. There's always time to get those dreams back on the front burner again. This year, we're going to be launching a lot of activities to stay connected because we are hardwired to connect. And lastly, I would like to ask you, as we leave this talk, write down the answer to these questions. Put your responses where you can see them daily and share them with a supportive person in your life. Lastly, I don't know if you've ever created a vision board. They're powerful. Again, people who have prompts like this that they can see every day tend to accomplish their dreams and their goals. Join us next week as Dr. David Feldman focuses more on the science of hope. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we will be sending out the recording uh, within uh, by the end of the uh, end of the week. So look out for that email. Uh, as you exit this webinar, uh, you'll be sent a program evaluation and knowledge check question for today. Kindly ask you take the five to 10 minutes to complete that, especially if you are looking to earn the white before each points. Um, additionally, an email will be sent to you shortly with this link as well. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, tune in for next week with Dr. Dave Feldman, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody.